Yeah. You ready? I guess so. Are you ready? I'm ready. What are we doing again? Okay, so we're live. Uh, welcome, Courtney. Welcome to On Set. It's very exciting. Uh, I'm Daniel Norton. This is Dave. Courtney's here today helping us out. Hello. Seth's doing the. The punch you in the face, is that what I'm doing? Um, okay, so today we're speaking about uh, inexpensive lighting. Um, I do these every once in a while because people college constantly ask me, hey, can I do this with less expensive lighting? Because I normally use Profoto lighting. So we're working with um, what I think is good uh, in inexpensive stuff. And I say good meaning that it's cheap enough so I'm not up here with the five or $600 light saying this is cheap versus the $1,000 light. This is very inexpensive. Uh, it's gonna be $100 or less kind of stuff. So this is very, uh, very starter uh, type things. And we can definitely, if you understand lighting, you can uh, make whatever you have work. Obviously, there's advantages to having more expensive stuff, and we'll talk about that as we go through. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't shoot, right? Never feel like, I don't have something, so I can't work. Uh, you don't have to have the nicest lens. You don't have to have the nicest lights. As long as you understand the concepts, you can make good shots. Um, so yeah, and if you have Dave. So <laughs> we'll start off with, uh, with um, I think we're going to start off with constant lights. So one of my favorite uh, things to shoot with if I'm not using, uh, you know, like my profile lights, is tungsten lights or incandescent lights. So this is, oh good, this is, nope. Good. We do this a lot, we wrestle with this. I'm just gonna look at that camera. This is a Smith Victor, um, I'm gonna move it closer. This is a Smith Victor photo flood uh, type fixture. Now, when you get one of these kits, they come with like a lightweight stand. I have it on a C stand because that's what I have here. So um, the C stand actually is more expensive than the whole kit. Um, Basically, you've got a socket, uh, what they call E26, which is a standard Edison base, like a, like a household light. You've got an umbrella. And you've got a reflector. This happens to be a 12-incher, OK? A light bulb inside. This could be any light. The reason why this is important or this is good is because this is an actual photo flood light. Photo flood lights are color correct. If you set your camera to 3200 Kelvin, or to tungsten or incandescent, depending on your camera, you will get correct color with these. This is very important. Um, if you put a household light bulb in there, you're not gonna, you have to do some kind of custom white balance because you're not gonna have uh, uh, exactly the right color. It'll still be fine, but you'll have less color. Oh, we're waiting for you. Um, also, this is a thousand watts, or 500 watts, rather. You can get these in 250 or 500, so they're much brighter than a regular light. Um, so you're brighter, you're more consistent color. Um, you can, if you're in a pinch, Go to like a hardware store and buy a clip light. You probably, that's what everybody's thinking right now. Daniel, why would I spend $50 for this when I could just buy a clip light for $12.99? Well, this can handle a 500 watt bulb. If you put a photo flood bulb in a cheap fixture, you will have a fire, and not in a good way. So uh, that's why you want to go with these. If you do happen to buy a hardware store one because you're in a pinch, or that's all you can get your hands on, um, make sure you use lower wattage bulbs. Now you could put things like spiral fluorescence in here. The problem with that is that they're generally not good color. Fluorescent lights and LED lights are of a discontinuous spectrum. They're missing colors. So even if they're daylight fluorescence, they're still missing colors, which means you cannot get accurate color with them. You might be able to make it work. It might be fine for a portrait, but you won't be accurate. And accurate can be important for some things. Let's say if you're doing food or something, which, is, which I find these to be really great for. So, uh, photo flood, really simple. This is a kit of two of them. I think it was barely over $100, including stands, everything you need to work, um, including umbrellas. Umbrellas are uh, one of my favorite tools to use uh, anyways, and especially at low budget, because they're very, very inexpensive, right? Um, we're actually going to do an entire day on umbrellas in like two weeks or something. But um, this is a translucent umbrella, or a shoot-through umbrella, as they say, meaning that you put the, this part towards our subject, right? What's that going to do? It's going to give us a big diffused light, which is going to give us soft light, which is good for portraits um, and things where you don't want harsh shadows. But we'll start without the umbrella to show you the difference. Do you like to sit? Sure. Okay, we'll have you sit. Okay. She sits down and gets paid. It's nice, right? Nice life to have. All right, so this is a 12 inch uh, reflector, as I said. 12 inches is relatively small for a light. That means that our light is going to be hard. So you probably hear this a lot hard light, soft light. Ooh, a little echo there. Um, hard light has very abrupt 
changes to shadow. You're going to have a hard line where it goes from neutral to shadow. So that's basically what it is. So when we shine this on somebody, it's going to have that quick divide. The other thing it does is it really brings out texture. So if you're shooting something with a lot of texture, let's say we're shooting for the sweater, we might want to use the hard light source because that'll people are throwing stuff at me already. Uh, the, 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 we might want a hard light source because it'll give us all the texture of the sweater, right? That'll be really nice. But we often don't want texture in somebody's face, right? Which is why hard light is not necessarily uh, used a lot for portraiture of you know, your average people, but Courtney is far above average. Oh, thank you. All right, so <laughs> we do need to set our camera to tungsten or incandescent white balance, or 3200, depending on your camera. If you do not do that, your pictures will be orange. And so many people come to me and they say, Daniel, you know, you say to use tungsten lights and my pictures are always orange. I don't understand, well, your camera's set wrong. I'm sorry, it's, it's that simple. Um, I do want to kill these a little bit because we have fluorescent lights in here, which are daylight balance. Yeah, let's kill them all, why not? Sorry, online, I'll be a silhouette. Well, can you get a... Uh, that's probably fine. Yeah. All right, you're going to, one of the, uh, that's, thanks, Seth. One of the disadvantages of this type of lighting, though, is that it's not, even though it feels bright, we're shining on you guys, and you're like, oh my God, it's so bright. This is not that bright, really, when it comes down photographically, which means that even at the proper exposure, unless we get it really close, which we will get it pretty close, some of the light in the room is going to affect our shot. So it's not going to be perfect. That's where flash is, is more powerful, and we'll talk about flash in a little bit. Um, so, what? Yeah, so the bulb is a photo flood bulb. This one is a, a 500. You can get 250s as well. Um, basically, they're color correct. That's why you want to use photo floods. Now, they do make blue ones. I know, that blows, blows your mind right now. The blue ones are literally painted blue. They're painted blue. They, they're 4,500, so they're closer to daylight. So if you needed to max with a window or something, you could use the blue bulbs. They don't last as long because they're light bulbs that are painted blue, which means they get really hot and they'll, they'll, they break. Um, one downside to photo floods is that they're incredibly fragile. So you go through a lot of them, but they're also very cheap. So, you know, it's all a, a balancing act there. So we're, we've got our camera set at 1 50th of a second at 5.6 ISO 100. Um, and I guess we'll make a photo. We're just using the meter in the camera at this point because your camera has a meter in it, right? So why not use it? Questions so far? Answers? No? Okay. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Are you zoomed in? I am zoomed in a little bit. There we go. A little bit, yeah. I thought Dave was being, you know, uh, really uh, interesting with the composition, although that wasn't a bad composition. So, all right, so here we go. We have nice skin tone, right? This looks really nice on our skin, actually, because tungsten is not of a discontinuous spectrum, so we get beautiful color. It is warm, but this is a hard light. We can see the shadow edge, right? It's very kind of glamour type light, but you certainly can see that every little uh, line or wrinkle or whatever is going to show up here, you know? This is not necessarily a problem, right? It, it really depends on what you're shooting. Sometimes that could be to your advantage, um, but just be wary of that. Another advantage of shooting with hot lights is that it will uh, make your pupil get really tiny, which gives you a lot of color. So you can really show off the, the blue eyes if you have them, or brown eyes if you have brown eyes, I guess. Okay, questions about that? I'm going to answer the question that everybody has. Are you hot? No. OK, it's not that hot. Yeah, it's going to get hot. People will say, oh, doesn't it get hot? Yeah, it's 500 watts of shining at them. They're going to get warm over time. That's a trade off. I don't find it usually is an issue, but um, if you're in a tiny little space and you're running tons of lights, um, maybe it might get warm. But in the winter, we'd probably be happy about that. Um, let's add an umbrella, right? The umbrella is going to do two things for us here. Number one. It's going to make our light source larger. Larger lights are softer. That's the difference between hard and soft. The size of your light is what dictates that. So making our light source larger is going to make it softer. In addition, our light is going to become more diffused, right? Because this is diffusion, right? Diffusion or diffuse light, diffuse is opposite of specular, has to do with your highlights. So we're going to, if she was shiny, that would be very helpful, but she's not shiny yet. Um, okay, so we're going to put this in here. Eventually. Yeah, she'll definitely be shiny eventually. <laughs> um, so we're going to put this in here. You just slide it right through. You notice I turned the light off again because they're very fragile. Um, so be, be wary with, with photo floods. Um, cool. All right, I'm going to turn this on. Oftentimes when you're using a hot light, you should just make it known to your subject you're going to turn it on. But what do they do as soon as you say, I'm going to turn the light on? 
They look right at it. They always do. Every, every person does it. So, but at least you told them, so you can't feel bad about it. OK. So this is going to produce a much softer light. It's going to eat up some of the light. We're going to have to change our exposure now, right? So Dave, will, again, he's using the meter in the camera. But now we're, we're going to have a much softer light um, coming through. Not only is it larger, it's also closer, which makes it even m larger, because it's all relative to your subject. We should have like graphics of like how much things cost pop up on the screen. Can we do that, Seth? I don't know. Be like ten dollars, like a game show. The price is right. Okay, so softer light, right? See, we can see that. See the light, the, the shadows. You can see her skin looks nice. Here's the comparison. You know, and each one has a different feel that you may or may not want. Again, not nothing is right or wrong, it's just different. And, and it's good to know what you've got going on. This would be equivalent uh, to the sun just hitting somebody, right? This is like a, like a more of like a cloudy day. OK. Make sense? Cool. All right, so one of these, what I'm shooting with exactly right here, is going to cost you like 80 bucks max. Like That's like what that costs. So inexpensive. We can get a good shot. We do have a shadow on the background. People are going to ask about that. If there's a shadow on the background, the way to get rid of that is to move your light, right? Because the shadow is always going to be opposite of the light. So if we want no shadow, we either have to raise our light and tilt it down or move it more to the side, move the subject further from the background. That's all just putting the light in the right spot. We can, yeah, let's move it a little bit. Let's go above a little bit, do like more of a beauty light. And then you know what we'll do too is we'll add, uh, now these are very expensive. Can you talk about power draw continuous lights? Like if you plug it in a watch mode? Sure, I will do that. Can you get me the, the artisanal reflector? <laughs> sure. So, well, I don't know where it is. So uh, we had a question online about uh, the power draw. So this is 500 watts, right? A typical uh, circuit here in the US can draw about 1,800 watts max. So you could, you could plug three of these guys in. You should be fine if there's nothing else major plugged into it. Yes, if you do this for a living and you're running these eight hours a day, five days a week, it's going to cost a lot of money in electricity. I'm assuming that somebody setting up that kind of studio is not using these, I mean, at that point. That's when you things like fluorescence and stuff might pay off because of the, the power draw. But the amount of money you're going to spend on electricity for this is so minimal for a typical photo shoot, it's not really an issue. Um, just blowing a fuse might be. OK, so to add to our, our inexpensive kit, you could buy uh, any of the pop-up reflectors. We have Glow is the ones they have here. Um, or you can get one of these. Seth makes these in Brooklyn. They are expensive, but I don't. I spare no expense. So this is <laughs> all right. So now we've got the light in more of a butterfly pattern, which is getting the shadow, you know, out of where's the, where's the shadow, right? It's here. Okay, but it's not in our frame, right? We can use a reflector if we want to fill in the shadows that are on her face. Right now, it's very kind of glamorous, but we could add a little pop, like that. I'll hold it with the Seth technique, right? And now we filled in the shadows, right? So, makes and yeah, happier. it makes her happier too, yeah, exactly. Makes her happy. Right, so we got like, you know, more serious, you know, and then happier because she does a reflector. <laughs> so that's, that's always, you know. Um, and, and again, right now we're dealing with just a single light, yes? Can you talk about overseas 220 volt? Sure, um, people are asking about the, the going overseas, if you're working overseas 220 versus 110 or whatever. Not other countries in there right now. Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're in a country where your voltage is 220, then you would buy 220 lamps. I mean, it should be that simple. Uh, usually, the fixtures themselves uh, are uh, by, by a universal or whatever, which you could use. Like, I take this system probably and plug it in over with a with a plug adapter. I'd have to buy a different bulb over there, though. If you bring a 220 bulb here and plug it in, it will work. It'll just be very dim. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. So it's probably not a good idea to do that. It will work, but not the other way. If you plug a 120 bulb into a 220 system, it will explode which is very glorious. <laughs> OK. Nice and simple, right? Single light. Easy, right? Inexpensive. So now we're going to use it, two lights because uh, the kit comes with two lights. So the kit's like 100 and some odd dollars, a little bit over $100. You get two lights. Um, we can do a lot of things with two lights. We could like the background separately. You want to do like a hair light? Actually, why don't we leave that the way it is and then do like a hair light? Why not? We like hair lights, right? You like a hair light? I know you like a hair light. You, you this guy. Yeah. Dave is the master of all backlighting. Do you want to go just reflector? Yeah, let's go just reflector. Sure, why not? We're getting crazy over here, right? So we're going to add a light in the background for some separation. You could also light the background, right? You've got a lot of options. 
Two lights is, is going to give you a lot of versatility. Um, and usually these kits come that way. I think, like I said, like one light is like 80 some odd dollars and two is like a little over 100. So usually you're better off getting a kit um, if you are starting and you have budget for it. We're going to light Seth up over there. Any questions so far? Mm -hmm. I can't stand you guys, you know. <laughs> so, because of the fact that both our bulbs are the same power, right, we're going to primarily adjust our exposure of our lights by either putting something in front of the light, like let's say an umbrella, which reduces the amount of light, or moving our lights closer and further away. This becomes a lot more relevant when you have two lights, because we got to, like, let's say this is going to be too bright or too dim, we'll have to move it, right, relative to our subject to get it to be brighter. They do make dimmers. Um, however, if you put a dimmer on a tungsten light um, and start going down with it, it will make the light warmer, which may or may not be an issue. It really depends on what you're doing, but it will change the color. So if you have multiple lights and you don't dim them the same, oh, she's very glamorous, um, and you don't dim them the same, what's going to happen is you're going to uh, end up with your lights not being the same color temperature. Right? Boom. Now, that's like a big burst. I'm actually getting some of the back uh, hair light on her face too, so she's getting a lot of fill. This is very like over the top, like yeah, filled. Like you, the well, it's almost more light. So basically, I'm getting. <clears throat> so this kit, hold on. So this kit is. Uh, I actually even have it. Da, 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 da. So this one is the KU-1000, which has two 500-watt bulbs. Um, there's also the KU-500, which I normally use, which has two 250s. This one's a little bit more expensive. Uh, I think this one's like 130-ish. Special price. There it is. Oh, I'm showing it. By the way, Smith Victor, no offense, but come on. That, that's the picture you show? Come on. <laughs> I mean, they could have the glamorous Courtney. All right, so we've got that hair light thing going on. We could also light the background with it. So many options. Notice, too, by throwing that hair light on there, how it changes the contrast on her, right? It really changes the feel of the shot. Well, OK, so people are asking about what f-stop. It really depends on your camera. Um, if you can go to 400, let's say ISO, uh, and comfortably, I probably would do that if you're working with constant lights because you're going to be slow. Like right now, we're at a thirtieth of a second. Um, so if you don't have a tremendously fast lens, then you're going to, you know, want to uh, want to have a little bit more ISO there. I typically like to shoot around five six. You know, you can certainly shoot more wide open if you'd like. I think that like shooting wide open is, you know. Well, you get that expensive lens and you just want to like, okay, so that's really contrasty. We have some light in the background. Now let's yeah. fill in a bit with the, right? We can fill in. We've got that like kind of brighter background. Again, we only have one light. It's not going to be super even. So you always have to say that with only, with only two lights, we're going to have a harder time getting an even background. So keep that in mind when you're trying to do this kind of stuff. Maybe put it, can we put it directly behind her? Do you want one of those like, twish? Uh, so does a bulb change color over time? A little bit, but they usually don't last long enough to make a difference. These bulbs have something like a 10 hour, 12 hour uh, lifespan. They say longer on the box, but that's about what they really last. So, no. All right, short stand, perfect. We're gonna do like a little burst of light behind her, and maybe we'll put some color back there too. Seth wanted to know how to make the background a different color, so. He always has that question. They're asking if we can photograph for making the black background. Can we make the back, black background black? Sure. So many things that we could do. All right, so we're basically pointing this thing at the background. We're going to have like a burst of light. And then we're going to just, again, we're keeping this umbrella here. I kind of like the position of it. Uh, for her. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. Pretty good. That looks pretty decent. What's nice about this too is that when you're working with constant lights, you can pretty much see exactly what it's going to look like. So it's nice if you're learning, you can kind of like look at, I don't know how well you guys can see that from there, but you can actually see what the reflector is doing. 
you know, like it's not doing much there, but there's doing a lot. You're not allowed to see it. Only I can see it. So you can see what that does, right? The difference between having it there and there. Remember, I'm bouncing this light. Am I in the shot? Probably. She's so happy. Okay, so now we have a burst of light. Maybe that's a better way with like a vignette going on. I actually think we can open up or go a little slower. I think she's a little bit underexposed, but that's. Also, I feel like I might maybe tip the umbrella down a bit too. And get a little... Actually, instead of opening up, let's do this and then move it closer if we can. Oh, sorry. There we go. I'm going to do a little adjustment. If she's hot, you can do that. There we go. A little poof. Now she's a little hot because we moved in too close. So we did both things. We moved the light closer and we opened up. Although, actually, she's within the range. If, this is one reason why it's nice to shoot tethered. Is we can actually look at our numbers at the top to see if we're blowing things out. And I think we're actually there. Even though she's bright, she's not blown. There we go. And now we've got nice kind of even light on her face. We've got the background. has got this gray with like a bit of vignette, a bit of, a bit of vignette going on. Um, so we had a question about going dark on the background. And for that, I think before we do that, don't let me forget to do it. Actually, let's do that first, only because I'm going to let these cool off. So they do take a little bit of time to cool off, so keep that in mind when you're working. Can we turn this on for a second because we're going to go dark? Um, let's kill these. And let's, let's go to flash for a second. Um, I have here. Oh, actually, I'll show you the box. They give me stuff with price tags on it, so I know how much it costs. So this is the the, the flash point. It's 160. No, 120. 160, what is it? It says both on the back, 120. The 120 budget studio flash. So this is a little baby strobe, right? This is a flash. It's uh, I guess this one happens to be uh, 120 watts. What does that mean? It doesn't really mean anything, to be honest with you. Your watt seconds of your flash has to do with the capacitor's ability to hold electricity. That doesn't really mean much. All manufacturers use it as a, as a, a reference, but it only really matters relevant to these other flashes. So 120, this might be brighter or less bright than another 120 from another brand. So keep that in mind when you're buying stuff. What it does give you, though, which is nice, is a guide number. Oh, so guide number is the... Uh, the true measure of the flash. Basically, you divide the guide number by the distance, and that gives you your f-stop. So if you want to know how strong this light is, the guide number um, is uh, 125 at 10 feet. That means it's f12.5, theoretically, at 10 feet, if, you're, if, you, if you don't put anything else on it. So we have that. There's all kinds of other cool stuff here. Um, we put it in a little baby softbox, which I think was $22. So we're, we're like 60 bucks-ish for this. And what we're going to be able to do with this is get the space dark, right? A couple of reasons. One is we can bring our shutter speed up, because when you're talking about flash, you have what's called the synchronization speed. As long as you're at that or below it, you can shoot. Like, you don't need to be 1 30th like we are with the other flash. We can be at 250, which is the sync speed of this flash. So we're going to do our regular thing that we normally do. We're going to go 250th of a second, which is the maximum sync speed for this camera. Your camera might be 200 or 500, depends on your camera. We're going to go to 100 ISO. Our lowest ISO, because what we're trying to do is get rid of all the ambient light. And then we're going to set our camera at an aperture that will give us a dark space, which is around 5, 6, or F8 in this space. The way you figure that out is you just um, use the meter in your camera and make it so it's underexposed with the available light. So this lens is the Canon uh, 2470. We're using an EOS 1DX Mark II. Yeah. So let's make a black frame. Okay. So what we want to do is get a black frame. So we're going to shoot at our settings and look at our frame. If it's black, we know none of the ambient light's affecting our shot. That's key here. Right? So boom, it's black. Who thought that that would be a good thing to do, right? To shoot a black frame, but that's like what we do every time. So basically, now we know we're underexposed. I'm gonna go to my exposure slider, which is just something I like to do. I'm gonna capture one. I'm gonna drag it over until we start seeing detail. She's around there. Look, we didn't change the white balance yet. She's very blue. Yep. Um, so we start seeing detail around here which is about two stops underexposed. That's good for me. I like to be about two to three stops underexposed. The reason for that is 
in post, if we want to bring our shadows up, we want to know we have some room there. If I was only, let's say, one stop underexposed and I started bringing my shadows up in post, I might get some of the light in the room affecting my shot. So that's good. Now we're going to use the flash to give ourselves a proper exposure. And the way we do that is we're going to take our flash and put it in position. Maybe we'll do like a... Now, distance is important, right? Because remember, soft light, and this is not that big, right? In order to make it softer, I got to get it big relative to her, so I got to get it in close. That's also going to help with a not that powerful flash, right? Because it would be easier for me to get a good exposure. So I move the flash in pretty close. We're going to set it, since we have no idea, we'll set the flash at uh, its, maybe its lowest power. We'll try that first. Okay. I do have a light meter somewhere. And there's the guide number. You can also do math with the guide number, but I think we're doing. Yeah. Where if we go? There's a light meter. Uh, you don't need a light meter. You can, you can, so this light is roughly, all right, so we'll try it. We'll guess, all right? Dave put me on the spot here because he called me out. He's like, you do it with the guide number. So this is like, I don't know, three feet away from her. Roughly, right? The, the head of the flash. That's going to make us one third of the guide number, which is 4.5, right? But then we're eating light with this. About a stop, right? Yeah, about a stop. So we should be about 3.5, which is going to be a problem for us. At, uh, let's just see, though. Maybe I'm doing the math wrong, yeah. hopefully. So we should be like two stops underexposed. Yeah, we should be a little bit underexposed even with the flash. Let's just see. We're going to try it, and we'll see if my math was good. Probably it wasn't. What? They just hand me stuff to work with. I have nothing to do. No, it's way overexposed. So what happens when you do the math wrong? The world ends. I mean, you know, just, we just look at it and we go, okay, it's overexposed. So we just can turn the flash down. That's it at full power, right? Oh, that's at minimum power. I don't know where in the factory they measured their, uh, oh, it might be in meters. Oh. Oh. Who does the metric system here? No, but you do. Okay, good. Can you do the math for this? One. Three feet is one meter. Oh, okay. So one, okay, so we have to be one tenth. Okay, so we got to back up a bit. Yeah. Or we can close down the lens. Let's just close the lens down. Because I like the light closed. If we move the light too far back, it's not going to be hard. I mean, it's going to be harder, right? So let's go to uh, F11. Okay. Or we can do what Dave's going to do, which is smart. That's why I keep Dave around. He's moving the exposure slider the other way. So one and a half stops. One and a half stops. Probably yeah. what we need. All right, good. So we're going to close down one and a half stops. This is one reason why it's nice to shoot tethered, right? Because we can actually look at the image and go, hey. Hey. I mean, or you could use a Seconic light meter. If I say Seconic, they give me five cents. I have to keep you know, trying to get my budget here. OK, we're getting closer. This is basically what you're going to do. And don't feel like this is a terrible thing, right? You're learning. So we're going to take some exposures until we get the right one. It's fine. Nobody, nobody cares. You're a little underexposed, so let's give it a little more light. And yes, I get the idea of like somebody standing here, like I could stand up here and be like, use a light meter, but maybe you don't want to spend $300 on a light meter when you can only, you know, you have a $100 light. So you got to, sometimes you got to work with what you got. So let's give it a little bit more light, Dave, like half a stop. Or open up one or the other. Because remember, we can shoot at anything closed down more than 5.6. Right, so if I change my aperture to f8 or f11 or whatever, I'm, the room's still dark. But my initial exposure where I was uh, uh, dark was at 5.6. So if I were to open the lens up, let's say, to 2.8, I might risk getting some of the room light involved. Uh, one third or two thirds? One third. We'll just give her a little bit more. We won't overexpose her. We want to keep it a little moody. That looks pretty good. Now, even at this uh, distance and stuff, with, this has got a pretty decent spread. I guess we're still getting some light on the background, right? So, because uh, it's not completely black, so we're going to have to either turn the softbox or physically move our subject in the box away from the background if we want to get it black, right? Because right now, some of the light's hit in the background. So let's just turn it. We'll feather it, as I say. We've got plenty of light, obviously. So we're going to feather it past her this way, right? So that less light is, is going to be hidden over here, or no light, hopefully. That's the plan. And we'll see how that changes the light pattern. Right, a little bit, see how it wraps around a little bit. 
Now, the background's black, so we succeeded in that. But it's a little more shadowy than I like on the face, so I have this uh, handmade reflector. <laughs> There we go, we got a little fill, right? So now we've got some fill going on. You know, the light looks nice, it's directional. It's not as soft as the umbrella because it's smaller. And that's gonna be the, even though it's a soft box. Because size is everything. But it's nice to give, a, it gives a different look, right? It gives a nice shape. And you can also, you could do it uh, horizontally. Yeah, why not? So many options. Yeah, let's do a horizontal one. So the horizontal is going to cut our spread this way, right? Which would be nice. Let's say if we let's say she had a really bright top and we wanted to take away from it. She doesn't, so her top is almost identical in tone to her skin. She planned them. What's that? Oh, I like that angle. And then that I can also go horizontal with the reflector. Oh! I know it's crazy. It's crazy. It's nuts. And there we go. She's not right? impressed. Eh? No, <laughs> She's not impressed. no, she is. It's, it's, that's like the more she dramatic. Was last yeah, she was smiling. That's the dramatic look, right? Yeah, so funny. That was that was horizontal. You know, so we can see the difference. You know, it's 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 slight, but it's there. Right. <clears throat> happy, not so happy. Happy, dramatic, right? It's like moody, sexy. I'd say. <laughs> Okay, questions? No, wow, okay, awesome. So, was that enough time to cool those lights off, I wonder? Probably. Let's find out. Let me... Oh yeah, totally. All right, so, I have a treat for you. This, I'll even show the Flashpoint one because I'm just that guy. This is the Flashpoint Easy slave flash. I know, I'm below, about to blow your mind. It makes models sneeze. <laughs> so basically what this thing does, right, it looks like a light bulb. But it is in fact a flash. So let's say, for instance, I happen to have a Smith Victor photo flood set. I can take this flash and I can screw it in instead of the photo flood. That will give me a flash. Hopefully it's working. We'll find out in a second. All right, go. Do you want a highlighter with it? Does it fly? Oh, yeah. Right. I, I was just going to use it by itself. But we could, yeah, let's do that. Let's do two like lights. Oh, yeah, hell, heck yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Do it. I like it. Conjunction. 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 Junction. Okay, so, slave flash. This one actually happens to be a master slave flash, which means you could, if you didn't have another flash. So what a, a slave does, just so you guys know, is it fires when it sees another light fire. Right, that's what they do. So this one happens to be a master slave, which means it has a sync cord as well, so if I didn't have another flash, I could use it like that as well. Downside to this, I mean upside, it goes into your photo flood thing, so you're like golden, right? It's super cheap. Downside, no modeling light. Can't see where you're pointing it, which we didn't actually turn the one on here either, but th that did have modeling light. You know, no accessories really. You're just jamming in here. We can put a, an umbrella to it, of course, if we want. And this, of course, has no power control. But the little top of it, oh, I'll break it. I'll, do it. I'll show you on a different one. Mm -hmm. Well, they've set that up. The little top of it here, I have two. The little top comes off. Put, put, oh. <laughs> little top comes off. You could put gels in here to color it. You could put uh, neutral density, which reduces the amount of exposure. These can be a gel. You could also buy caps that are uh, colored for gels, which is kind of cool. You could spray paint them. They're asking if can I use a speed light as a slave flash? Can you use a speed light as a slave flash? It depends on your speed light, whether or not it has built-in capability to do that. But yes, you could also use a speed light, um, which would be a good use for it. But well, free if you have it, I guess, but more expensive than this stuff. That's why I didn't go speed lights. Um, but sure, you can also buy uh, inexpensive uh, secondhand speed lights and use them as slaves. Some of the older Nikon, oh wow, that's actually pretty nice. 
It's very glamorous. It uh, all right, so let's go. Oh, let me get the. No, I think it's good. I like the flair. It's very, it's very like soap opera. <laughs> get off serious. Yeah. There we go. So I lost my train of thought. Yeah. Soap opera. Soap opera. No, no, something else I was saying before that. <laughs> no, something that was actually relevant to the discussion. But anyways. Um, yeah, you can you can use a sp oh, speed lights. You can buy inexpensive speed lights. Some of them have a built-in mode. Some of the old Nikon ones, especially, um, have what's called uh, SU4 mode, which is a uh, like a like a built-in slow. So you could do that. Um, you can also buy what's called um, uh, eye slaves. They're made by Ween. Usually, you put them on your hot shoe, and it fires like these. So yeah, you could definitely use a speed light for that if you have them floating around somewhere. But that's actually pretty nice, right? And we're basically using something that we you know, already had. Now, you could, and we'll just make it simple, you could mix flash with tungsten as well. I'm doing all your demos now, really in all in really, one. Um, Seth will have nothing to do, because I'm doing them all. <laughs> all right, so let's say, <laughs> let's say we want to, uh, what's the simplest way to do this? Yeah. All right. I'll see if this cord fits in here. Because I really like the way this one is, and I don't want to open another. Yeah. OK, so we're going to use this as a master. I'll test it. So if you want to test these things, this is why you wear snaps. OK, that worked. Yeah, you're just closing the circuit. All right, and we're going to use a tungsten light as our main light in the umbrella. Now, then we'll have to decide whether we want her to have cool hair or warm skin. Probably cool hair is going to be better, because I feel like warm skin might be too much. But somewhere in the middle would be perfect. But we don't have a middle. Questions, thoughts? Are you blown away? Yes. No, he's not blown away. He's got no. Yep. Are you calling me out like it didn't work? It might have done anything. <laughs> He's totally calling me out. Oh, no. Oh, no. I did something. Oh, what? I Thanks. Really have a hard time <laughs> no, it's oh, OK. This is the thing. When you're using a reflector, especially, I mean, in the beginning, it's so easy, especially when you're using them outside. Everybody takes the reflector, and they stare at the person, and they go like this. Don't look at the person when you're using a reflector. Look at the light. Light bounces off. It, light moves in a straight line. So if I, if one, oh. Apparently, my sound doesn't move any further. When I reflect, I look at where my light is and where I want it to bounce back. So if I'm reflecting onto, oh, perfect, onto, onto well, where's my light? I'll just do it over here. So my, she's here. I see my light is here, so my reflector needs to bounce back, right? Uh, so I put it where the light hits it. That's the key to the reflector to make it work better. The angle of instance is equal to the angle of reflectance. What do you like? I got to say it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So where do I want the light? Yeah. Where do you well, that's a good question. So it depends on what you're going for mood-wise, because the position of your light, see how he never answered the question? The position of the light will affect the mood of the shot, right? So you can, if you want just a standard thing, put the light so that it's like around eye level, a little bit higher is a good, safe place to put it. That'll light the whole face evenly and not have any shadows that are going in the wrong direction. We generally want our shadows to have a slight downward angle, right? So if you look at the shadow here, see how it goes down a bit? The reason for that is the sun, right, is our main light source in life, or when you're in buildings, the lights are always above you. So any light below you is going to create an odd light, even side light. So having it a little bit higher than the nose will keep the angle more unnatural. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. No. <laughs> and then where the reflector goes, to answer that part of it, is the opposite of the light, right? Would I use auto white balance in this situation? Only if I didn't know how to set the white balance on my camera. No, I wouldn't use auto white balance ever. Um, the reason for that is I want my shots to be consistent even if they're all wrong. Because it's easy to fix them later, to go in if they're all off. So auto white balance is going to change each one a little bit, right? 
So what I want to do is figure out what I think is the, the closest white balance to what I want and set it there. We can use the Kelvin scale, and this particular camera has that ability. Is that what you're doing? No, no. We never know what Dave's doing back here. He's doing all kinds of stuff. <laughs> we could do a custom white balance, though. That's different than doing an auto white balance. So this, see, I took it out and used it. This is a, 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 a PhotoVision, right, PhotoVision? Yeah, digital target. Right now it's potato chipping a little bit. It also has a little reflector on the back, bonus. This has two purposes. This, well, we could use it earlier. This uh, is a white balance uh, selector, so basically it's neutral, right? It's not a gray card. Gray cards are for black and white photography for certain exposure. This is neutral, meaning that I can take my white balance off of it, but also it is black, gray, and white, which means that if I photograph this under my light and I'm properly exposing, I should get a good histogram. In other words, three lines, the center one, one on either end, right? So you can actually use this if you don't have a light meter, which that's why I said we should use it earlier. We could have held it in the center and made a photo and then adjusted based on our histogram. So especially if you don't have a computer that you're shooting into, that's a good uh, tool for this. But we'll just use it for white balance, though. Why not? You hold it in front of the model's face or grill. You make a photo of it uh, that's properly exposed. This looks a little bit bright, but it's probably fine. Um, and then we're just going to click on, I usually just click on the gray part. All right, now, Capture One will automatically set, yeah, because I've copied from last set on all other, so it's going to copy my white balance now in future photos. So if we make another photo, it should be this white balance from now on. This is a raw file. It's not a permanent change, so if you don't like it later, you can always change it. She doesn't like that white balance. It's clear by that photo. <laughs> uh, but you know, now we have a white balance that's neutral in the front. If you change the light source, you have to adjust the white balance again. That's correct. You should change your, the, the ideal way to use this target, and this is how you should use it, that's why I put it on my thing so I don't forget it, is that you wait till your light is where you want it to be. So I generally set my camera, like I know I'm using a tungsten light, so I set it on tungsten. Then I get everything the way I like it, and once I'm ready to actually start shooting, I, then I make a custom white balance. Because even just moving the light could change this because it might bounce off a blue wall or you know whatever. So yeah, you want to do it once you're set. What do you think, Dave? Like it's not firing every time because that's what happens with the. Now, you could use pocket wizards. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Are you doing something funky? Maybe. OK, Dave's doing something funky. Let's see what happens. Let's just wait. I just wait when he does these things. And then I take credit. <laughs> no, I. He's doing a shutter drive with a tungsten key and then firing the strobe by hand. Yeah. Ah. We are literally doing all of your demos. Yeah, you're really it's probably hard. easier if you, you <laughs> want to use the light meter. We'll use the light meter to fire it. Uh, yeah. Oh, hold on. It is. It is all parlor tricks. All right. So. Oh yeah. So capture one versus Lightroom. I refuse to speak on that topic. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, it's two different beasts. Capture one is designed for capture. Lightroom is not really. You can shoot into Lightroom. It's not the same. If you shoot a lot tethered, I recommend trying Capture One. It's a 30-day free trial. Try it. Make your own decision on that. I, I don't know too many people that, that have not like, started using it once they started to. It's, it's very good for Capture. I, I, I think this is uh, yeah. Oh, dead? Yeah. I oh. tried it with the hands on. It was a little weird. OK, so we're not going to go. Oh, you know, I can do it for you, though. You can also pop it by hand. Let's get our audience participation. I'm so excited, Daniel. All right. <laughs> Who wants to come up and press the button? Gary Don't slink does. back in your chair, Gary. Gary. Get up here. Get up here, Gary. All right, so. <laughs> All right, Gary. <laughs> There's a button on the other side of that light. See it? Yeah. All right, you've got to press that button at the right time. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's how we do it here. You'll know. You'll know when the time is right. What is the location of this? Yeah. Oh, we're at Adorama. Uh, kind of short, right? Oh, that wasn't terrible. Uh, we are in the Adorama uh, event, space. event space, AKA home of Seth. Um, <laughs> so we're in, uh, we're in New York City. So if you guys uh, have never been here before, uh, obviously you have been. This is not for you, because you're sitting here, right? Uh, so uh, yeah, we're on uh, 1842 West 18th 
42 West 18th Street. I, I, don't, I, don't, I just walk in this general direction. <laughs> and uh, there's stuff here all the time, right? We, uh, usually at night, but uh, during the day they let me take over. Did you do it? Was it good? Well done. Well played, Gary. Good, good, good. Would you rather take the picture? Yeah, good, 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 good. Should I take the Yeah, do it. What are you asking me for? All right. Come on, Gary. You're taking enough classes here. All right. This is Gary. He's taking over. Watch that lens flare. Hold on. Let me do it set style. I'm going horizontal though. He never goes horizontal. I go horizontal. He never goes horizontal. Don't even start there. <laughs> nice. Nice. It's it's a it's 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 good except for the fact that the the, the flash didn't go off. Well, that's why there's no blue. Yeah. But she looked good. Does it, does it matter? You see, but by the way, do you see the flash? Watch, watch, watch it. Yeah. See it? Well, if you want it again. Yeah. So all I'm doing is putting it opposite the light, right? The light's there. There's a, you see it? Yeah, yeah. You can see it, right? Okay, nobody else can see it but you. That's good. All right, here we go. Okay. I do like this upper angle. Yeah. It does. It's luxurious. Oh, and she's looking so angry. Who's holding that reflector? What is this? Listen, if the, if the photographer doesn't tell me it's in the shot. I mean, Seth just holds a reflector himself. Yeah, I know. He refuses to have anybody. Oh, Michael Smith is asking yeah, me to yeah. What's that? Michael Smith is asking me to come watch. He's in NYC right now. Yeah, Michael, come on down. We're going to be here for a little bit. Then, well, and then again hurry up. Uh, we'll probably be here for like another 15, 20 minutes. Uh, then at 3 o'clock, we're doing this again. So, uh, uh on Facebook. Yeah, well, if he's in New York City, he can carry up. Come on. If you come now, Michael, you can shoot the camera. Go ahead, Gary. You can sit down. All right, so. Actually, Gary, hold on. Come sit here and be the model. Courtney, take the picture. There we go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. All right, so. Come on, Gary. That's what you get for slouching. So, first of all, we're going to bring in Gary. I'm not going to add the reflector until I see, because oftentimes on men, we like shadows. So let's, let's see if the shadow looks good on you. You seem shadowy. Courtney's got it. Are you still dragon? Yeah, why not? I'm a little dragon. Oh, interesting. So actually, I sucked at all his confidence. Look at that. You can see um, I'm on the wrong thingy here. The 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 fluorescents are affecting the shot. Yeah. Right. Which is good or bad depending on what you want to do. Let's 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 kill them so you see the difference. Okay. Now let's try it again. Yeah, and that one too. The one that's actually shining on him might be the good one to kill. There we go. Now it's much darker, right? It's fine. Now we can add our reflector in. <coughs> actually, you hold it yourself since you want to know how to hold the reflectors. <laughs> Get it in close. Closer is better. Just not in the shot. They're going to ask for Gary when he gets here. <laughs> well. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> now we get the reflector, right? Simple enough? Reflector. Makes sense, right? OK. <laughs> Questions? Yes? I have no idea. Oh, I know. Yeah, we didn't explain it at all, did we? OK, good. I'm glad that you asked, because everybody else is probably looking at me like, OK, so this flash has a test button. So we can test it to see where it's falling. And we're just having them press the button uh, instead of firing with the, the sync cord. The reason why we did it that way is because we want to uh, fire it at the end of the exposure. Uh, and you can't do that like this. There is a thing called rear curtain sync that you can do with like on, like, actually, can you rear curtain from a sync port? I don't think you can. If somebody in the line knows how to do that, let me know. What? Rear curtain, can you rear curtain from a sync port? Maybe you can. You, yeah, you can. You just have to actually set your camera to output at a rear thing. Let me take a look. I got you. You're good, Gordon. You can sit okay. back down. Thank you. Icon. Well, mm -hmm. There's a flash setting in there, right? Ah, sure, I'm sure. We'll figure it out. Any questions while I'm looking through this, I'm trying to figure things out in the middle of the demo? It should be a That's how I roll. There should be a button. I do not. For the next session at uh, at three o'clock, we will figure out how to do that because that's actually a really good question. Can we rear curtain from the internal of the camera? I've been using pocket wizards for so long that I don't even think about it anymore. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah. If you haven't used the target for the white balance, yep. how would you have uh, dealt with uh, yeah, two different lights? Okay. So if I hadn't used the digital target, I would just usually set it towards the light that's my main light on her, which is the 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 flash. Uh, the, the tungsten light, rather, yeah. 
because I'd rather have her skin tone look good and her hair be off than the other way around, you know, personally. But if you wanted to go with, with a more, you know, orangey-faced uh, person, which is what would have happened, then I could do the other way. I mean, we can do that, actually. Go ahead and set the white balance to flash, and let's just do one like that so we can see the difference. We'll just plug this in and do it the regular way. Mm -mm. We went like advanced during the basic class. What are we doing? No, we're just going to do it regular. Just no, take no, a picture no, no, no. with white balance on, uh, on flash. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? The problem was the, the slave's not triggering. That's what I was saying. Oh, well, oh, the slave won't trigger. From the cable. Yeah. Oh, at all. Oh, yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah. Oh. That's what I was saying. That's the problem. Oh. <laughs> This I did not know. The slave wouldn't trigger. That's why Dave started doing it that way. He was overcoming a problem that I didn't know existed. Yeah. Probably because it's not the same cable that came with it. All right, go ahead, switch it. Yeah. You're good. Yeah, let's just bring it in. All right, this is why we have to have lots of stuff. It's cheap, so you buy a lot of it, right? That's how we go. Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna, I am. I'm going to do a run through now while Dave's changing this. Um, hold that for me. OK, so just in case you just joined us or so you have a question or like you don't want to ask, or maybe you'll have a question as I go through. So we're covering inexpensive lighting today, of course, uh, if that didn't make any sense. Dave is now currently setting up a Flashpoint Budget Studio Flash. This is $39.95, special price. Um, the little flash that we're using in the last sequence was called a slave flash, right? This is like practically free. I have no idea how much it costs. This one is like maybe 20 bucks. Right? Mainly what we were working with here is this kit, this Smith Victor kit, which is, includes two, oh, no, maybe go to the main camera because I can't turn this whole thing anyway. It includes two uh, photo flood type fixtures, stands, bulbs, umbrellas, has a free subway pass in it. I mean, it's basically everything you need. Um, you, you don't get that boom that's in that picture. I don't know what's going on there. Um, <laughs> If, if you wanted to hold on, <laughs> look at the various shots you can take with this. Hold on, we have to show the side. You can take a picture of a dog. Hold on, let me do this. Let me do this. Hold on, let's get some lights. Okay, okay. So we got we got a picture of a dog there. <laughs> All these subjects are totally good. A it's flower, a, a, brand new family, a baby. Yeah, yeah. All right, perfect. <laughs> you can do all those things with this kit, and more. So there's basically, that's what I should, well, no, I, one time we did food photography and we reshot the packaging because it was so bad. Remember when we did that? That was fun. It was bad, though. I mean, this is not, whatever. They shot that picture in 1972. It was fine then. It's fine now. There's two versions of this. One comes with 250-watt bulbs uh, and I think 10-inch reflectors. That's called the uh, KT500. Uh, 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 oh, that's kind of nice. Yeah. A little, a little hot. That's not terrible. So hot shoe flashes, like speed lights that are inexpensive, I don't know what things cost, but um, Flashpoint, which is the, the, the house brand, is pretty inexpensive. I personally would rather buy a used Nikon speed light if I was going to buy a speed light. Um, and you know, and not using TTL and stuff. You're talking about a used speed light. Get like a like a, a SB uh, 27, 28. 28. It's one of those. Like you can get those pretty cheap. They're going to be workhorses, and they they they're, just, they're awesome flashes no matter what you use. SB 8 is cheap. SB yeah. So that's what I would buy if I would, and I'm and you know and I'm talking about not like even if you don't have Nikon. Like that's the flash I would buy if I wanted like a, a inexpensive uh, shoe flash, because you can run it in in manual. Um, and you could also run it. I think that one has automatic mode as well. So you can do automatic instead of TTO. That's not bad. I forgot what we were doing, though. Horizontal over here. Boom. All right. This is actually correct white balance, though. We want to set it so the white balance is set to flash. Right. So now we're going to set the white balance to flash just to, to see the difference. And that should make her more orange. <laughs> So we have a single shot. Oh. Oh, yes, because it's grabbing it from last, so I have to do it here. No, no, here. Uh, here. We got to change it. Nice shot. Yeah, what's happening is it's grabbing from the last. There we go. Oh, there we go. Okay, so if this has ever happened to you, you have your camera set wrong. I'm sorry to say. 
It's easy enough to fix. Just go into your uh, setting. You want to change it to tungsten, and bam, done, right? Tungsten light has great color. It's just not the same color temperature as daylight, which means that you need to set your camera to the right color temperature. That's why you want to, want to do that. The flash in this case looks blue because the color, color temperature of the flash is you know, cooler. Now, we could make this any color we want, any color we want, um, with some gels. All right, so this is a jelly roll. Not that kind of jelly roll, but those are delicious. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. We got some gels in here. Oh, look, I think I even have a CTO. Is that a CTO? Yeah, sure. I think this is actually a full CTO. So CTO is color temperature orange, um, which will turn flash to tungsten white balance. So let's try it. I think this is what this is. How convenient. So if you want to mix light sources, because you're wild and crazy, It's a 34, 3407, which I think is full. I'm not sure. I'm going to find out in a second. We're going to find out. OK, that's fine, because we're set to flash. We'll switch it to uh, tungsten or shot. And there we go. Now we've mixed it. Boy, what, that's like another one of your demos, right? I just did it. I do each one of your demos in, in, in fact, here we go, one more time with the reflector. Hold on, I want get, uh... Hold on, Dave's, Dave's gonna fix it. <laughs> you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna also make the background blue. <laughs> that's not my demo, that's someone else. That was somebody else. Throw fake blood at it. <laughs> All right, now we're neutral, right? We're, using, we're mixing flash with tungsten by gelling the flash. Always gel the flash versus gelling the tungsten if you can because the flash is more powerful, right? And gels eat a lot of power. Let's say, though, that we want our background to be bluish. We have a flash here, and the flash is going to be blue, right? So where's that uh, little stand? We'll see if we can get now. The only issue with optical slaves is that they need to see the other flash go off. So we'll see if this is going to work or not. We're going to try it. You gotta position them where it will actually see the other flash. So we'll put it back here. We might find that, uh, oh, we're using it there, I see, okay. All kinds of changes, or I can just hold it. Yeah, we'll do it this way. We'll do it the correct way. So it's important to change light stands as many times as possible during the shoot. Makes it look like there's stuff going on. Charge extra for that. So now, this, because it's flash, I'm going to kind of point it down a little bit to hopefully get a little bit of like a gradation. Um, because it's flash, if it goes off, um, what's going to happen is it will be blue relative to everything else, right? Hmm. No, I don't think it's going off. Sadly, I don't think it's going to work. Where is it? Oh, no, I should not. I think it went off that time. Yeah, let me flip it up, too. Yeah, we'll tail it up with the, yeah, okay. That's fine. All right, let's try. No, no, it wasn't charged up. Will I go to the UK and do a show? Absolutely. I love UKs. UKs. There should be an Adam. I would love to. Do you guys, can, I'll go hang out with Gavin. Yeah. Make some camp. In his small home studio. <laughs> I love Gavin Hoey. Okay, it's not going off because it can't see it. I'm using a softbox. Not working. Yeah, that's a good idea. See, Dave's full of ideas. We're going to remove the reflector. The reflector is blocking our. Uh, our thing. Questions while we're doing this? You might be asking yourself, hey Daniel, why are you doing this now? I don't really know. I, I can't answer that question to be honest with you. Try that. 
All right, here we go. Caught it. You saw that. Nada? Could you use a bed sheet as a backdrop? Sure. Why not? Yeah, I mean, anything could be a background. Just be wary of wrinkles. I mean, you don't want it to necessarily look like a bed sheet, or maybe you do. I mean, you know, it depends on what you're going for. I would say, generally speaking, they're thin, which could be an issue for backgrounds. What you pay for in backgrounds when you're dealing with paper is the thickness of them. Thick, like good backgrounds, like canvas backgrounds, are thick. Bed sheets are not thick, right? So. It just doesn't want to work. What if you open up the salt box? Open up the back end of the salt box. Yeah. Oh, but that fired that. <laughs> yeah, right? Of course. <laughs> Welcome to my life. Okay, All right, here we go. The, the center of it. Yeah. In the right spot. All right, here we go. Nope. I think we got a dud. It does happen. So we may have we may have we may have a dud that worked there. Yeah. Well, that seems less than convenient. No. So let's switch. Yeah. Okay, we're just gonna swap out for a different one because you guys probably don't want to see us just keep trying to fire the flash the whole day. Maybe you do want to see that. I don't really know what you want to see, to be honest with you. Okay. the eye is over here. There should be No, that's not the eye. Oh, yeah, I think that is the eye. Yeah, there you go. Boom! <laughs> this one fired that time. Yeah. Okay, so. Okay, so we switched. What happened there? The thing that sometimes happens when you buy cheap stuff. See, that's a, there's always going to be a side thing to this, right? Uh, I'll, I'll do that quick uh, thing now that I said I was going to do at the beginning. One thing that, what you pay, oh, that's kind of cool, actually. All right. What you're really paying for when it comes down to it with equipment, uh, professional photo equipment, is reliability and consistency, right? If you're learning to light and you're messing around, this is fine, whatever. My friends are fine with me messing around. Apparently, you're fine with it. Uh, with me messing around with this thing, right? Because we're learning, right? We're going through this process. If you, oh wow, very devilish. If you are hired to shoot somebody's portrait, if you are hired to shoot somebody's portrait, you don't want your stuff failing, running back and forth. Oh, sorry, that didn't work. You know, that kind of thing. You want to be able to nail it and make it happen. So as you progress and you start to want to do this maybe in a more uh, professional manner, especially for money, you really should start thinking about having like higher end equipment because that's really what you're paying for. So can you do all this stuff and make shots look cool? I can make a whole portfolio of shots, right, with this equipment and you would never know I didn't use my pro photo lights or whatever. But when I'm there and I have a, a CEO there and I have five minutes with them, like I don't want that happening, right? And that's what you're paying for. So just keep that in mind as you're growing through your equipment. And it's always worth it. I was telling Seth, I have, the reason why I pulled these slaves out is I, was, I, I still have a bunch of these. And I still throw them up and use them sometimes when the time is right. So don't feel like anything's really a waste. Um, so just to be clear, the background is blue because of our white balance. We're set to tungsten white balance. And the flash is daylight, which is why it looks blue. It's a streak because of the exposures on even obviously. And we can't control the exposure. It actually worked out perfectly. And we did that on purpose. <laughs> I swear, no. OK, questions, thoughts, concerns before we take a break? Yes? Um, so when you were handling the light bulb that was the mm -hmm. one, uh, you kind of just grabbed it by hand. But when I do did. you know when you're able to touch the light bulb and when you're not supposed to touch certain light bulbs? Like halogens in it? OK, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was going to be a wise guy and everything, but I won't do that. So, when you, right, I did. Photo floods, you're usually fine with just grabbing, which is basically the question. I'm assuming you don't mean if it's too hot. I mean, I know it's too hot because I just put my hand next to it. But you mean if it's OK to grab the bulb? Yeah. yeah. Those are fine because they're like regular light bulbs. If your hands are all greasy, you just had some KFC or whatever, you know, make sure you clean your fingers first. Don't, if you see marks on them, usually if I take one out for the first time after a while, I'll like just wipe it down to make sure nothing weird is on it. Because what it could cause is a hot spot on the bulb, which will make it crack and break early. But photo floods, as hot as they are, don't get nearly as hot as like halogen type bulbs, which are under a lot more pressure. Um, 
Those ones you don't ever want to touch with your fingers. You should wear gloves or use a little piece of tissue or whatever, but not like plus plus because that is lotion on it. You know, like a clean piece of tissue um, because that will certainly break if you, if you get your fingers on it. So uh, halogen type ones, like the more uh, compressed ones, you can't touch. But ones that look like regular light bulbs, you can touch them for the most part. Yes? Oh, um, okay, so cheaper backdrops. I mean, paper is pretty inexpensive. It's not super portable, granted. Um, they do make pretty inexpensive fabrics, but what you end up paying for, again, they're thin, so it's a trade-off. Um, Westcott makes a system called X-Drop, which is pretty inexpensive. I think it's around 100 bucks for the setup plus the one single backdrop. It folds down into a small case. It's only for one person, but if you're doing portraits, it's good. They got a lot of different colors for it, so that's pretty inexpensive and portable. I'd recommend that. It takes up a little bit of space because it's like deep, but, um, but it's pretty good. Yeah. Other questions? You said the slave light is linked up with the other one. I don't see any cases like the like Magic. <laughs> okay, right. So basically, um, he's asking, how is a slave light firing? There's no wire. It's an optical slave. So when it sees a flash fire, it fires. So if you had a flash out here in the audience and you fired it, it would fire, theoretically. Um, that is both what makes them awesome and terrible because of that. It has to see the flash fire, which means if it doesn't see your flash, it won't fire. And also, if somebody else is firing flashes around you, let's say that you're doing portraits at a wedding where everybody's firing cameras around, this would not be a good option for you because they just keep going off when it shouldn't, right? So keep in mind your tools for what you're using. Just one mod. what would I recommend if you had one modifier? Well, if you're going inexpensive, I probably would go with an umbrella, but if you could only have one thing, as much as I hate to say it, because this is what everybody used when I was first starting and I went away from it, is I would probably get a softbox if I could only get one thing, because I think that's the most, your, your most versatile modifier. Um, you get a medium size, bigger than this, obviously, um, if it's the only thing you have. You can do a lot with it. You can cut the corners with it, you can block part of it, you can put extra diffusion, you can take diffusion away. I mean, a softbox is, probably do an entire demo just on doing different stuff with a single softbox. I mean, softboxes can be really versatile. Umbrellas are great. You can do a lot with umbrellas too, and they're inexpensive. So um, that'd be my second pick. I would not buy, if I only could buy one thing, I would not buy something like a ring flash or a beauty dish or even like a magnum reflector, which is like one of my favorite modifiers because those are very specific and it limits you, right? Softbox is pretty generic. Umbrella, very generic. So easy as that. Other questions before we break? Yes? Yeah. Is there a benefit of that flash only versus mm -hmm. Sure, so the benefit of using only flash is that you don't have to worry as much about the, your environment, right? The flash has the power to remove the available light much easier. If you remember when we were shooting Gary, and he was sitting here and one half of his face was bluish light, that's because these fluorescents, even though they don't seem that bright, were affecting our shot, right? So if you're somewhere and you're shooting and you can't control all the light around you, using constant lights, means you have to use way more power to overpower the light around you, where with flash, you can overpower it very simply. So flash definitely has that advantage. Constant lights are nice for learning and they're pretty inexpensive. That's why I recommend them when you're learning. Ultimately, if you stay with photography primarily and not photography and video, you'll probably move to flash because flash has got that power. Other questions? Nope, nothing. Okay, good. Awesome, so thanks for coming, guys. We are going to be back up at three o'clock uh, on Facebook if people want to watch. Um, next week we are doing, it got canceled and then we rescheduled it. So if you saw it before, like a month ago and we didn't come to it, it was when we snowed. We got snowed out, that big snowstorm. Um, we're doing, basically I'm going to set up one lighting scenario with I think four heads on flash. And I'm going to show you how just by switching lights on and off, you can create completely different images without having to move your stand. So basically creating multiple uh, setups with a single setup. It's great for doing portraits where you have to get a lot of different looks. So we're going to do that next week uh, at noon. On, on YouTube, we'll stream. We'll be here in the store if you guys want to come see it. Um, Mike, was it the guy's name, Mike? The guy that's coming? Oh, yeah, Mike, if you want to come to 12. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, when's your next thing? I always pitch Seth. Oh, every Monday. I keep forgetting. Every Monday, Seth is doing uh, something on our Instagram. Get on our Instagram because not only can you see great pictures of New York, which is most of what our Instagram is, but also uh, Seth goes on every Monday and he just like acts a fool and does awesome stuff and what? He showed like cool, uh, cool lighting techniques and stuff on Instagram, so it's kind of fun. That's on our Instagram stories. Check that out on Mondays. Thanks, guys.